I'm Joe Graydon. And I'm Terry Graydon. Welcome to this podcast of The People's Pharmacy. You can find previous podcasts and more information on a range of health topics at peoplespharmacy.com. There are thousands of medical conditions that lack effective treatments. Could old drugs be repurposed to help? This is The People's Pharmacy with Terry and Joe Graydon. Dr. David Fagenbaum was on death's doorstep with a rare disease. He was able to research the potential of an existing medicine to save his own life. Once a drug loses its patent, the pharmaceutical firm has little incentive to keep investigating other possible uses. Dr. Fagenbaum has made it his mission to learn how existing affordable medications could help with hard-to-treat conditions. Are miracle cures hiding in plain sight? Coming up on The People's Pharmacy, unlocking the life-saving potential of old drugs. In The People's Pharmacy Health Headlines, when we mention vaccines, most people think of a shot at a clinic, pharmacy, or doctor's office. Next year, many Americans will be able to get their flu vaccines at home. It won't be a shot, though. The FDA has just approved flu mist, a nasal spray vaccine, for home use. Parents will be able to vaccinate their kids from 2 to 17 years old. Anyone 18 to 49 can administer it themselves. This may seem like a novelty, but flu mist has been available in doctors' offices for more than 20 years. The vaccine will still require a prescription. Public health officials hope, however, that being able to get vaccinated at home will help more people get protection from influenza. Bird flu continues to pose challenges for public health officials. That's because there's growing concern about the potential for person-to-person transmission of H5N1 influenza. In Missouri, an individual who had no known contact with animals like chickens or cows became ill with H5N1 in early September. Since then, the CDC has reported three additional people in contact with the patient also developed symptoms. One was a member of the same household. The two other cases occurred in healthcare workers who looked after the original patient. This cluster raises the fear that the H5N1 virus has mutated so that it can spread from one person to another. Public health officials have been downplaying the risk, but the acting director of Epidemic and Pandemic Preparedness and Prevention at the World Health Organization is calling for better surveillance and testing in the U.S. She's calling for improved collaboration between animal health experts and human health sectors. At last count, there have been 14 confirmed human cases of H5N1 in the U.S. If this virus begins to infect people the way it has attacked poultry and cattle, we could be in for another pandemic if we don't act swiftly to track and treat it. Whooping cough has been more or less controlled for decades because of a vaccination that used to be called DPT that stood for diphtheria, pertussis, and tetanus. Pertussis is the medical term for whooping cough, a bacterial infection that attacks the lungs and produces a distinctive-sounding cough. Sometimes the cough is so severe that a person could break a rib. Babies may stop breathing during the coughing spasm. These days, whooping cough can be prevented by vaccines called DTaP and Tdap. During the pandemic, many young children did not get their usual well-child checkups when routine vaccinations would have been administered. That may help explain why there are more than 14,000 cases so far this year. Before the pandemic, the U.S. averaged almost 10,000 cases a year. Vaccine hesitancy that started during the pandemic may be a contributing factor to the resurgence of this infection. As Americans grow older, they tend to collect health conditions. Along with those, they end up with an increasing number of prescriptions. What happens if their doctors focus on reducing the prescriptions, also known as de-prescribing? 
A study published in JAMA Internal Medicine suggests nursing home residents may have improved cognitive function when their blood pressure medications are scaled back. The investigators analyzed data from more than 12,000 residents of a VA long-term care facility. The authors point out that while antihypertensive medications can reduce cardiovascular risks, they increase the chance for falls, dizziness, and drug interactions. The authors report that residents who were deprescribed antihypertensive medications had slower cognitive decline when compared with residents who maintained a stable antihypertensive regimen. Psilocybin has shown promise against depression, but we don't have long-term data comparing it to standard antidepressant treatments. A recent study compared six-month outcomes when depressed people were randomly assigned to take two doses of psilocybin with psychological support or six weeks of the SSRI drug escitalopram. Both groups were significantly better after six months, but those who got psilocybin fared best. And that's the health news from the People's Pharmacy this week. Welcome to the People's Pharmacy. I'm Joe Graydon. And I'm Terry Graydon. A few years ago, we spoke with a young physician who has an amazing story. While in medical school, he was suddenly taken ill with a life-threatening condition. His brush with death led him to an extraordinary discovery that saved his life. Today, he's saving more lives by repurposing old medications for new uses. To learn more about this amazing project, we turn to Dr. David Fagenbaum. He's Associate Professor of Medicine and Founding Director of the Center for Cytokine Storm Treatment and Laboratory at the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Fagenbaum is also co-founder and president of Every Cure and co-founder and president of the Castleman Disease Collaborative Network. His book is called Chasing My Cure, A Doctor's Race to Turn Hope into Action. Welcome back to the People's Pharmacy, Dr. David Fagenbaum. Oh, thanks so much for having me. Dr. Fagenbaum, you have an amazing story. You've shared it with our listeners in the past, but for those who may have forgotten or who have never heard what happened to you, please give us an overview of your brush with death. Sure. I went from being this healthy third-year med student. I wanted to become a doctor in memory of my mom who had died from cancer a few years before to becoming critically ill out of nowhere. My organs all shut down. I was so sick, a priest read me my last rites and uh, I said goodbye to my family. My my dad, my sisters, my girlfriend um, said goodbye to all of them. And uh, fortunately I was, I was diagnosed right around that time with a disease called Castleman disease. Um, but unfortunately there were no treatments for Castleman's. And so um, I got very, very sick. My doctors tried a bunch of different chemotherapies and they would sort of help me for a short period of time. But I kept relapsing and um, I eventually uh, realized that if I wanted any chance to survive, I would need to discover a drug to save my own life. Now, Dr. Fagenbaum, just briefly, what is Castleman disease? It's a disease where your immune system attacks your vital organs for an unknown cause. We, We don't know what starts it off, but for whatever reason, my immune system just destroys my heart, my liver, my lungs, my kidneys, my bone marrow. And um, up until recently, the only way to stop it would be just to obliterate the immune system with chemotherapy. And chemotherapy can kill. I mean, you had to get very high doses in order to shut down this autoimmune condition. What changed? The biggest change for me and the, the reason that I'm, you know, I'm here chatting with you guys again, and it, it's so good to be back on the show, is that I discovered an old drug called serolime, which is also called rapamycin, um, that had never been used before for my disease, um, that based on laboratory work I did, I thought that maybe it could treat my disease. And um, I began testing it on myself. And this past January marked 10 years I've been in remission. So I'm approaching 10 and a half years now. Yeah, n- never imagined that there was a drug out there. And I think so often about the fact that my doctors told me very early on in my illness that we were out of options. You know, we've tried everything. There's nothing more we can do. And the most amazing thing is that actually there was something more we could do. And that something more was on my local CVS's shelf. 
it was sitting right there, but we just didn't know it could be used. And so that's really been my life's work for the last 10 years to figure out how many of these drugs are out there that we could potentially use in new ways. And I know this is something that, that you are both really passionate about. Well, we are. And I think our listeners want to know, well, what was that drug just sitting on the shelf at CBS that had never been used for Castleman disease? And tell us a little bit more about it. Sure. So serolimus uh, was originally discovered, it's an amazing story, in the soil of uh, the island of Rapa Nui uh, in, the, in the Pacific Ocean. And it was initially developed as a potential antifungal drug, and then it turned out to be pretty lousy as an antifungal, but really good at preventing organ transplant rejection. So if you were to get a kidney transplant, your immune system would destroy that kidney unless you took serolimus. And if you took serolimus, it would suppress your immune system so you wouldn't destroy that kidney. And it had been studied for a few other uh, rare conditions, a lung condition called uh, LAM, um, and a few other conditions, but it had never been used before for Castleman. So we know how serolimus works. It works by turning off a, a key communication line in your immune system called mTOR. Um, and what I discovered in the lab doing experiments on my own blood samples and my lymph node tissue was that that communication line mTOR was turned into overdrive. And so it was a very simple realization for me. And I was just a, a third year med student. And it, what I realized is, okay, if I've got this communication line turned into overdrive and my immune system is going out of control, maybe I could find a drug that can just turn this communication line off. Maybe we can just turn the alarm switch off basically with this drug serolimus. And I have to say, I wasn't actually all that confident that it was going to work. You know, I, I hoped it would work. Um, I didn't know if it would. Um, and I, but I really had no other options and, and I really wanted to kind of go out swinging and see if maybe this drug could work. And, and thankfully it did. You know, I suspect that mTOR was discovered partly around the same time that they were really investigating this uh, rapamycin when it was a brand new drug because mTOR, if I'm not mistaken, stands <laughs> for mammalian target of rapamycin. <laughs> So That's exactly it's, it's right. really wrapped up with the drug. <laughs> That's right. You know, people will ask, how did you know that serolimus or rapamycin would be the right treatment when you found out there was too much mTOR? And I said, well, actually, the answer is in the name. Like you said, mTOR, the R in, in mTOR is rapamycin. So the potential drug for it was literally in its name. Well, it's an amazing story. And I think, you know, it, it kind of reminds us that... People may have to, you know, really dig deep when they are under tremendous, not, not just pressure, but I mean, you were on death's doorstep. And I'm just curious because you have described three steps for overcoming adversity when you were fighting for your life. Could you please share those three steps with our listeners now? Yeah, I think often about um, the, when I first was sick, I spent almost six months hospitalized in ICU and I was having multi-organ failure and pain that is hard to even describe, full body pain because my vital organs um, were being literally attacked 24-7. It was horrible. And just as you said, I think you can kind of boil it down to three things that helped me make it through that. Because frankly, if you told me on day one that I was in the ICU, that I was going to have to endure that for six more months, I don't think I would have been able to. Um, and so, so, so maybe I'll, I'll share those three steps or, or three, three components that helped me to, to make it through. The, the first is that I had a vision for the future. So though I was literally dying in an ICU bed, all I could think about is maybe having a family one day with my girlfriend, Caitlin. Uh, developing drugs in memory of my mom, who I had promised I would uh, develop drugs in her memory when she died from brain cancer. And so having this vision for what I wanted in the future, it helped me to keep fighting. The second thing is that I needed my family by my side. So my, my sisters literally never left my side. Neither did my dad. My dad spent every single night in the hospital room sleeping on the pullout couch. And my sisters spent every single day by my side. Um, and my dad was there pretty much every day too. And I remember at some of my lowest points, hearing my sisters by my side and feeling them squeeze my hand and saying, just breathe, David. And there was a point where it was so painful to breathe and I was slowing down my breathing and I was, I was basically moving towards uh, a state where I was you know, preparing to let go and pass. Um, but I remember hearing my sister say, just breathe, Dave. And 
And it's like, okay, I, I can do that. Not because I have the strength, but I can do it because I can feel your strength. You know, you're, I, I'm going to do this for you, G and Lise. And, and then the third thing is that I really took it one step at a time, or maybe in my case, it was one breath at a time. Because again, I never could have uh, imagined fighting like I did for six months. And then it turned out that I had multiple relapses and it ended being a total of about three years that I was sick, but I could do one breath at a time. And then I could do another breath and another breath. And all of a sudden there I was surviving six months of, of really what was like torture. And I think that that formula of a vision for the future, support by your side and one step or one breath at a time is something that any of us can utilize to get through difficult times. And, and that was actually one of the main reasons why I wrote my book, Chasing My Cure, is that I felt it was so important to share some of these like sort of secrets or lessons that I learned along the way, because I still don't know today how much longer I'm going to be here. And I certainly, you know, when I was uh, battling this disease at first, almost 14 years ago, I didn't think I would be here for very long. So I really wanted to get these messages out to the world. Well, when we first spoke with you, you really impressed me with your concept of hope, which is way beyond, oh, wouldn't that be nice, or wishing it sure. were so. But the idea that for for you to have hope, you need to have a a vision of how something could happen, and then you need to take action to help it happen. And that makes a lot of sense to me. Well, I so appreciate that. I think that um, growing up, I oftentimes understood hope as being something that didn't require action. It's let's be hopeful. Let's hope for something. Let's pray for something. Let's wish for something. Um, and that that was an act in itself to be hopeful. You know, look for the silver lining, be positive, be hopeful. Um, but then after my mom passed away from cancer and then I went into medical school and I saw horrible suffering and um, I, I started an organization in memory of my mom called AMF for grieving college students. And so I spent most of college and the years after college hearing from people about the grief that they were going through. And it really drove my mind. Uh, and then certainly when I got sick with Castleman's towards saying, if we're facing something that's challenging and if we're hoping for a different outcome than is expected, we must take action. And um, very quickly, I, I started, started getting almost uh, positive reinforcement that as I was taking action, positive things were happening. So going out to Little Rock to see the world's expert for Castle disease ended up saving my life when I was at my sickest. I'm beginning to do laboratory research on myself, helped me to understand and discover a new drug. You know, and both of those times I was hoping for something and then I started taking action. And and throughout the life that I've had, it's now been almost 14 years since I got sick. Um, what I like to call my overtime, I've continued to reflect on what am I hoping for? What am I praying for? What am I wishing for? And then what can I do today, tomorrow, and the next day to get closer to the thing that I'm hoping and wishing for? You're listening to Dr. David Fagenbaum, Associate Professor of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. He's author of Chasing My Cure, A Doctor's Race to Turn Hope into Action. After the break, we'll hear about Dr. Fagenbaum's organization, Every Cure. What other drugs might be repurposed to treat currently incurable diseases? Research on old drugs that have lost their patent is less appealing to pharmaceutical firms because there's less potential for profit. You're listening to The People's Pharmacy with Joe and Terry Graydon. This podcast is made possible in part by Cocovia, maker of the most proven and concentrated flavanol extract in the market today, Coco Pro, Coco Extract. September is Healthy Aging Month, and it's a reminder that it's never too late to get started on better health practices, like finding a wellness routine that works for you. Part of that routine can be adding clinically proven cocoa flavanols to your daily regimen. Whether you're looking to prioritize your heart health or brain health, you can find a supplement to fit your needs with Cocovia. All Cocovia supplements contain the number one bioactive flavanols, CocoPro, backed by 20 plus years of research. These powerful bioactive nutrients are clinically proven to promote cardiovascular health and improve cognitive function as you age. 
so you can stay physically active and mentally sharp for healthy years ahead. Get 20% off all Cocovia products from September 19th through October 3rd using the discount code AGEWELL2024 at cocovia.com. That code again, AGE, A-G-E, W-E-L-L, 2024, all uppercase, age well, 2024, at cocovia.com. These statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Welcome back to The People's Pharmacy. I'm Joe Graydon. And I'm Terry Graydon. The People's Pharmacy is made possible in part by Cocovia Dietary Supplements. September is Healthy Aging Month. Why not take care of your heart and brain health by adding cocoflavanols to your daily routine for cardiovascular and cognitive support? How can Cocovia be part of your routine to age well for better years to come? More information at cocovia.com. Today, our topic is the life-saving potential of repurposing old drugs. Once a medication has lost its patent, pharmaceutical firms have little to no incentive to explore new uses. Our guest today is trying to unlock the hidden potential of these affordable old medicines. We're talking with Dr. David Fagenbaum. Associate Professor of Medicine and Founding Director of the Center for Cytokine Storm Treatment and Laboratory at the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Fagenbaum is also co-founder and president of Every Cure and co-founder and president of the Castleman Disease Collaborative Network. He's author of Chasing My Cure, A Doctor's Race to Turn Hope into Action. Dr. Fagenbaum, you have put a lot of things into action with your organization called Every Cure. And recently, you received an amazing grant, if you like, from the federal government of nearly $50 million, which is extraordinary. I I suspect 10 years ago, you couldn't have imagined such a scenario. Tell us what happened and what the goal is. Sure. So um, over the last uh, 10 years since I started taking serolimus and it saved my life, um, I've just been completely on fire with this idea that there are more drugs that are just sitting at our pharmacy that could be life-saving for you or someone you love. And I've dedicated this time to unlocking as many of them as I possibly could. I joined the faculty at Penn about nine years ago and launched a center here where we do deep immune profiling and we've discovered a number of drugs that could be repurposed. And, and we're really proud of the 14 drugs, which include serolimus, that we've identified and advanced for diseases that they were not intended for. Um, but as we think about the, the literally 22,000 diseases out there and the fact that the vast majority of them, approximately 19,000 of the 22,000 diseases that humans are affected by don't have a single approved drug. When you think about the massive Uh, unmet need of people suffering. And then you think about the potential for the drugs that are on our shelves to help more people. And then I think about the impact I've been able to have through my center, kind of one disease at a time. Um, Several years ago, I started having discussions with my co-founder, one of my co-founders, Grant Mitchell, and also our other co-founder, Tracy Zakora, around how can we scale and automate what we've done? How can we take insights like mTOR is important to Castleman disease and look across all drugs, all diseases, and all of human biology to find insights like that to unlock new uses for old drugs. And can we do it at scale? And so began really dreaming about this back when I first got sick 10 years ago and found this drug, but really began turning this concept into action about four or five years ago. And then um, two years ago, decided to launch this nonprofit, Every Cure, with the goal of doing this at scale. And in particular, we utilize the world's biomedical knowledge as a starting place. And then we apply a handful of different artificial intelligence algorithms to the knowledge to basically repeat what we did in my case and we've done in other cases, but to do it at scale. So we're using AI to actually look across all 3,000 drugs and the likelihood that they can treat all 22,000 diseases, which means that we were we uh, basically program these algorithms to, to compute and to generate 
66 million scores for every drug against every disease. And then we use that as a starting place to then decide, okay, well, these 10 drugs for these 10 diseases look really promising. Let's move them forward. And then and then in terms of working with, with ARPA-H, it's a brand new federal agency. And um, we believe that uh, that what we were doing was a perfect fit for this new agency. They were created to fill the gaps in our healthcare system between what industry and drug companies are doing versus what academia is doing and government's doing. And amazingly, no one has been focused on ensuring that the 3,000 drugs that are approved by the FDA are utilized for all the diseases they can treat. And so we thought it was a perfect fit. And thankfully, the government thought that it was a great fit for them as well. Now, Dr. Fagenbaum, you've told us a bit about... Um serolimus and finding that it can be used for Castleman disease, and in your case, very successfully. You mentioned that there are 13 other drugs that you have found that can be repurposed. Could you tell us the story of one or two of those other drugs? Sure. Uh, I'll, maybe I'll share my, my two, two of my other favorites. Um, so one of them is uh, a rare cancer called angiosarcoma, um, where uh, it was uniformly fatal. And a, a patient came to our center in 2016, and um, he had failed to respond to the two chemotherapies that were out there and uh, asked, you know, is there any way we can find a repurposed drug? And we did something really simply. And all we did was look in the published literature, and we found that back in 2013, there was a paper published from just five patients with angiosarcoma and four of the five patients that increased expression of PDL1. Now, PDL1, program death ligand, is a really good biomarker if you have high expression in your tumor that you'll respond to a PD1 inhibitor. Um, now, this is back in 2016, so we didn't know all that much about PD1 inhibitors and PDL1, but we did know that if PDL1's high, a PD1 inhibitor is probably going to work. And so this paper said four out of five people with this form of cancer had increased expression. We said, gosh, maybe we should just stain his tumor and see if his tumor has a lot of expression. And it did. And so we started Michael on, at the time, the, the first patient that we were aware of to be treated with uh, this drug pembrolizumab, a PD, PD-1 inhibitor. And Michael, this April, just celebrated eight years of being in remission on this PD-1 inhibitor. And the reason I love this example so much is that, first off, I'm so happy Michael's doing so well. Um, but just as importantly, as a result of him doing so well, doctors at MD Anderson started giving it to all of their angiosarcoma patients. And pretty soon it became clear that almost a third of people with angiosarcoma respond beautifully well to this treatment. Now, it doesn't work for everyone and it doesn't work long term for everyone, but it has actively saved many, many lives. And what's really cool is that it's now recommended in treatment guidelines for how do you actually go about treating angiosarcoma. So that that's one of my favorite examples. Another one is an example where we played a role, but we didn't play the driving force. And that's with a rare disease called DATA2. And DATA2 is a rare disease that affects um, individuals um, uh, at birth. Um, they're born with this rare condition. And they begin to have strokes and um, hyperinflammation um, that occurs from the time they're, they're born. Uh, and they oftentimes die in their teenage years because they have so many strokes. It's just it's heartbreaking. Well, it turns out about 20 years ago, a doctor tried a TNF inhibitor for data two. And um, the story is pretty amazing. Apparently, this doctor had some extra TNF inhibitor in a syringe. He thought one of his patients sort of looked clinically similar to another patient. So he tried it and that patient stopped having strokes. And um, he had a few other patients with data two and he, he treated them with TNF inhibition. They didn't have strokes. And, and years went by before this really was spread around the world. And then this amazing person named Chip Chambers, um, sadly, two of his children um, were diagnosed with data too. But thankfully, Chip is this amazing advocate who um, went on this incredible journey to get the world working together and sharing insights. And all of a sudden, it became clear that, oh my gosh, the few doctors that are trying TNF inhibitors, none of their patients are having strokes. And I mean, none of them. If you give a kid a TNF inhibitor that has data too, they stop having strokes and they don't die. But it took Chip Chambers coming together and getting everyone to start talking to one another and sharing this information. And so Chip came to us several years ago to get advice on, okay, we've got all these insights. What do we do next? And so we gave him advice on how do we develop guidelines for how do you recommend treating data too so the doctors around the world actually treat it with a TNF inhibitor? How do we package the data in a way that's compelling to doctors? And so we supported Chip with that. And now TNF inhibition is used all around the world for kids with data too. 
and they're not having strokes and they're not dying from their disease, a drug that was always there. And, and one of the reasons why I love this example is that the insight had been made by another doctor. We didn't even have to discover it. We didn't have to even uncover it. All we had to do was help to disseminate it. And so these are the kinds of things that, that we're excited about with every cure is to unlock new modes of action like we did with serolimus for me, to take um, mechanisms of action that are in the literature but haven't been translated into patients like we did with pembrolizumab and angiosarcoma, but also take examples where it's already being done, but it's not being done enough and to get it spread to the masses like we did um, with data 2 and a TNF inhibition. Dr. Fagenbaum, those are wonderful examples. For people who may not know what you're talking about when you say very quickly, pembrolizumab, <laughs> what was the drug originally developed for? What was its FDA approval? Great question. So pembrolizumab was initially developed for melanoma and for lung cancer. And it was specifically made for people that have increased expression of PDL1 in those cancers. And what we figured out and what many others have figured out over the last 10 years is that it actually doesn't matter where your cancer is. If it's in your lungs, your heart, your brain, doesn't matter where it is. If you've got increased PDL1 expression, then you are likely that you could respond to this PD1 inhibitor. Now, so far it sounds great. And I think you've also looked at some other drugs for Castleman disease. Am I correct? Oh, absolutely. And beyond serolimus, which was a drug, as you mentioned, that was developed originally to prevent organ rejection after transplant, what else have you found for Castleman? A couple others of my favorites. Um, one of them is ruxolitinib. Um, that's a, it's a JAK inhibitor. It was developed for a cancer of the bone marrow called myelofibrosis. And we discovered that uh, there was increased JAK. JAK is like mTOR. It's a, it's a communication line in your immune system. Um, different from mTOR, but it's the same family of communication lines. And we discovered that, that this pathway or communication line also seemed to be an overdrive. And um, we heard from a doctor in Chicago whose um, patient had been in the hospital for about a year with Castleman's. Nothing was working. Serolimus, the drug that's saving my life, didn't work for her. Chemotherapy didn't work for her. Nothing work, was working for um, this young girl named Kyla. And um, I told the doctor, I said, listen, it's really early, but we've got some data in our lab that suggests that maybe JAK inhibition could be useful. Why don't you try ruxolitinib? And um, so this amazing doctor in Chicago decided to try it for Kyla. Um, and Kyla had a beautiful response. Um, she's doing incredibly well. She's actually getting ready to go to Marquette for nursing school um, this September. And now we've started to treat other patients with it. And we're actually launching a clinical trial, hopefully by the end of 2024, to look at ruxolitinib in more patients. And I, I think it's important. I mentioned this concept of a clinical trial. We're using it in patients. Um, many of the listeners will be aware that drugs can be prescribed by doctors uh, through a process that's called off-label prescribing, which means that it's not approved for that use, but they can prescribe it. Like my doctor prescribed serolimus to me off-label. So doctors can legally prescribe any drug they want for any disease that they want to prescribe it for. Um, the question is, is whether there's sufficient data to do that and whether the insurance companies can actually cover it. And so with these deadly diseases like Castleman's and angiosarcoma and data 2 um, insurance companies tend to uh, approve um, drugs that might be life-saving, um, but it's not always so easy to approve a drug or to have a drug utilized off-label um, if maybe the disease is not as life-threatening or maybe there is less evidence. Um, but we are, we're doing a trial to generate more evidence for Rexlitinib. Well, we understand that uh, about one out of five drugs is actually used off-label, and um, I'm wondering if you would tell us a bit about um, a medication that uh, I think you have been involved in finding the repurpose for, and that would be Zolair, which started as a drug, I believe, for asthma. And you better spell that for us. <laughs> Z-O-L-A-I-R. And, and I, I wish I could um, say that I was part of the Zolair um, work, um, I, but I was I not think, a part by of- By the way, I think it's- X O L A I R. Oh, is it? I think you might be right. Sorry about it that. It sounds yes. like um, Zolair, <laughs> but it's yes. X O. Um, yes, X O L A I R. And as and now you can really tell that I wasn't involved <laughs> in the development of it. Um, uh, but I have been really involved in advocating or just highlighting 
how great of a story this is. Um, so the backstory on Zolaire was that it was initially developed for um, allergic asthma, and it works really well. It's a beautiful mechanism where it basically eliminates the antibodies in your blood that cause allergy. Um, and so whether it's allergic asthma or maybe some other allergy, if you're getting rid of, uh, they're called IgE antibodies, then you're going to get rid of the, really the things that underlie allergic reactions. And this was developed about 20 years ago for allergic asthma and very effective for that. And thankfully, about five to seven years ago, the makers of Zolaire um, at uh, Genentech spoke with some researchers at NIH and the researchers at NIH said, well, if this drug, which just works by eliminating antibodies that cause allergy, why don't we think about trying it for people with food allergy? Because food allergy is just mediated by these antibodies, these IgE antibodies. Why don't we try it? And to um, Genentech's credit, they didn't have to do this by any means. The drug was soon to become generic, but they decided that they would put the time and effort and resources into doing a really big trial of people with food allergy. And the results came back beautifully positive, where basically people who have horrible food allergies, I mean, some people have food allergies where they can't actually even go out to dinner because just being exposed to the air of, of some of these allergens can be too much for them. And so all of a sudden, these people with really severe food allergies can get an injection of Zolaire, and which eliminates and removes these antibodies that can cause allergic reactions, and they can live more of a normal life, and they, they can be exposed to these allergens in small amounts without having horrible allergic reactions. So one of the reasons I love that example is because the drug was on patent still, but it was soon to become off patent. So the drug company didn't have to pursue it. It's not going to be a major money maker for them. I mean, it is a, a, lo a lot of people do a food allergy, so who knows? Maybe it will make a lot of money for the drug company. But the reason I like it is because there's a lot of opportunities like this where companies don't end up pursuing a new use for their drug, not because they're bad people or they are, have negative int intentions. It's because they selected one or two diseases to pursue, and they have to think about what's the next drug that they're going after. They can't develop drugs for new uses when the drug is generic because they're not going to be able to justify the expenses. And so this is just a good example where I think they did the right thing. And I think a lot of people are going to benefit from it. Dr. Fagenbaum, you've just brought up a really critical issue. And that is the fact that a lot of these old drugs have lost their patent. They're, they're available generically and they're relatively inexpensive. What drug company is going to spend literally millions or hundreds of millions of dollars developing an old drug that they can't patent for a new use. No drug company is, is, is the answer. Um, and that's why we had to create every cure because you're exactly right. If the, if the numbers don't add up, if you can't justify spending millions of dollars to do a trial um, because you won't make any money because the drug is generic, then you won't spend the money to do the trial. So that's why we created every cure is to identify these promising opportunities then work with the federal government, work with philanthropic organizations, work with individuals to fund the millions of dollars of trials that need to be done so that these drugs can save lives in a system where the system doesn't incentivize that, but we've just got to bypass the system. You're listening to Dr. David Fagenbaum, Associate Professor of Medicine and Founding Director of the Center for Cytokine Storm Treatment and Laboratory at the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Fagenbaum is also co-founder and president of Every Cure and co-founder and president of the Castleman Disease Collaborative Network. He's author of Chasing My Cure, A Doctor's Race to Turn Hope into Action. After the break, we'll learn about some of the pitfalls in repurposing old drugs. This became very evident during COVID-19. Dr. Fagenbaum shares his insights on controversial medicines like ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine. Repurposing old drugs requires new thinking. When drugs are used for other than their original purposes, they might need new dosing schedules or have a different side effect profile. One example is Viagra, sildenafil, which is now being prescribed for pulmonary hypertension and might be helpful for Alzheimer's disease. You're listening to The People's Pharmacy with Joe and Terry Graydon. 
This podcast is brought to you in part by the People's Pharmacy and our exclusive line of magnesium-rich roll-on deodorants crafted with years of expertise and community feedback. Our customers rave about their ability to control odor effectively without aluminum. These deodorants are a superior choice for daily health and comfort. It's designed to be gentle yet highly effective, providing reliable odor control without aluminum or other harsh chemicals. Plus, they're incredibly easy to use and long-lasting. As a special offer for our podcast listeners, enjoy an exclusive 20% discount on any size of our deodorant. Choose between the handy 2-ounce scented or unscented varieties or the economical 3.38-ounce unscented version. Simply visit the body care section in the store at peoplespharmacy.com and enter the promo code POD20. That's POD20. That's POD20 during checkout to redeem your discount. Remember, this promo code POD20 gives you 20% off your purchase of our top-rated magnesium-rich aluminum-free roll-on deodorants until October 2024. Welcome back to The People's Pharmacy. I'm Joe Graydon. And I'm Terry Graydon. The People's Pharmacy is made possible in part by Cocovia Dietary Supplements. September is Healthy Aging Month. Why not take care of your heart and brain health by adding cocoflavanols to your daily routine for cardiovascular and cognitive support? How can Cocovia be part of your routine to age well for better years to come? More information at cocovia.com. Two of the most controversial treatments during the pandemic were ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine. These are well-established old drugs that are effective for their approved conditions. They became politicized during the pandemic because some physicians wanted to repurpose them to treat COVID-19. They maintained that these medicines were curative, while others dismissed them as ineffective. Our guest today is Dr. David Fagenbaum, Associate Professor of Medicine and Founding Director of the Center for Cytokine Storm Treatment and Laboratory at the University of Pennsylvania, where he is one of the youngest tenured professors in the history of Penn Medicine. In addition, Dr. Fagenbaum is co-founder and president of Every Cure and co-founder and president of the Castleman Disease Collaborative Network. He's author of Chasing My Cure, A Doctor's Race to Turn Hope into Action. Dr. Fagenbaum, this all sounds so exciting. I mean, this idea of repurposing old and often inexpensive drugs for new and challenging treatments until we walk into the minefield. And <laughs> I can't think of a better example than COVID-19. Yep. So here was a condition that had everybody panicked in the beginning. We didn't have any drugs for it. We, we, we were losing people at an astonishing rate. And along comes some researchers, some scientists, some physicians, and they said, aha, we have the answer. It's hydroxychloroquine. It's an old drug. It's inexpensive. Just give people hydroxychloroquine. And then somebody else came along and said, aha, I've got something even better than hydroxychloroquine. It's ivermectin. These are marvelous drugs. And they're inexpensive and they're relatively safe. And oh my goodness, the controversy got started. <laughs> and I think we're still experiencing it. I, I happen to love ivermectin. It has saved the eyesight of millions of people in Africa and Latin America. The drug works beautifully. Our dog gets a little ivermectin. What is it, Terry? Every, Every month. month. Yeah, to, to avoid uh, <laughs> heartworm. heartworm. So it's a great drug, and it is really quite safe. In fact, I know somebody who had a bad case of scabies, which is called, what, the itch that won't stop, or it's a, the scratch that really. won't itch. Or no, what, it, it's, it's very itch itchy. That, <laughs> it keeps, sure. and, and he got some ivermectin, and it worked beautifully. 
So give us the insight on these drugs where there is such controversy and confusion and, uh, and still, to be honest with you, hasn't gone away. Yeah, it's it's such an important question, and I I do believe that COVID is um, such a great um, example where there was a tremendous amount of of repurposing that was done. I think there's a lot that we can learn. Um, anytime I think about COVID repurposing, I think about the amazing fact that the very first drugs identified for COVID that saved literally millions of lives were dexamethasone and tocilizumab. And that was within three months of the pandemic starting that dexamethasone was discovered to be effective uh, in the most severe COVID patients, hospitalized patients on oxygen, reducing mortality by 30%. This is a drug that costs $10 for a 10-day dose. You could reduce mortality by 30%. It was just incredible. And tocilizumab, not quite 30%, but it's somewhere between 15 and 20% reduction in mortality, which is additive to the dex. And so within the first three months of the pandemic, our medical system discovered, this is the global medical system, discovered two drugs that reduced mortality almost by 50% when you add them together. Now, those drugs were so busy saving millions of lives um, and, and just frankly working um, while all of us were so worked up um, having these discussions about other drugs um, where it just wasn't as clear. Um, and so I think that anytime we talk about COVID repurposing, I think we have to acknowledge that um, repurposed drugs were really the the workhorse of saving lives during the pandemic. It, it wasn't uh, Paxlovid, it wasn't hydroxychloroquine or ivermectin, it was really dexamethasone and tocilizumab, and baricidinib came along a little bit later on. Um, but to your questions around hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin, I think everyone listening and everyone in this world should have been really excited when we heard, heard the early results about both drugs. You know, hydroxychloroquine, uh, there was a study of about 100 patients in France where um, uh, researchers described nearly, I think almost all, maybe it was 97 out of 100 patients that were given uh, hydroxychloroquine out of, out of the hospital didn't ever get hospitalized. And when I heard that, I was like over the moon. I think all of us were so excited. With ivermectin, the early results were around a number of cities where um, ivermectin was given as sort of a a prophylactic public health measure to a lot of people that didn't yet have COVID, but it turned out that many of those towns where they gave ivermectin to a lot of people, they didn't end up having big spikes in COVID infections. And again, that's really, really exciting. I, I and, and many others were super excited by those early results. What became more challenging to understand is that as we did clinical trials, particularly with hydroxychloroquine, um, there were about 20 clinical trials done in the first year of the pandemic. And 19 out of the 20 clinical trials did not meet their primary endpoint, which means that they, what we, or what those researchers said a priori is, okay, if you hit this, it means it worked. If you don't hit it, it means the drug doesn't work. 19 out of 20 of them failed to, to hit that primary endpoint. Um, ivermectin was much, much, much more um, uh, up in the air, meaning that it was about 50-50. About half of the ivermectin trials indicated that the drug was working. About half of them suggested the drug was not working. And so I interpret that as meaning that it's likely that ivermectin probably plays a role in some patients with COVID. However, we up until this date still don't know what's the kind of patient that might benefit from it. It doesn't look like if you give it to everyone, it's likely to work for everyone. Um, it's sort of a 50-50 a sort of split. That said, around the same time that those studies were being done, Paxlovid trials came out that appeared to be much more effective um, in preventing hospitalization. And so I think that, I think there's a lot that we can learn from this and that's that we should always follow these early insights from observational data, whether it's sort of public health data like with ivermectin or it's a case series like with hydroxychloroquine. But we have to remember that diseases, um, based on their natural history, will really affect how you assess drugs. So a disease like Castleman's, where everyone dies within a few months if you don't treat them, if you treat them and they don't die, you know the drug worked because everyone else is dying if you don't treat them. A disease like COVID, where not everyone dies if you don't treat them, makes it really hard to determine if when you treated them, whether it was a drug that helped them or whether they would have survived anyway. Um, so it's just, it's really tough. There's another interesting aspect to repurposing old drugs because they originally were developed for condition X and the drug company developed a dosing schedule and, you know, a particular range of, 
of how long you should take it. And then along comes something like COVID, and we have no clue what the dosing yeah. schedule should be and how long people should take it. And so the initial trials might have been too short with the medication. Completely. So there's just a lot of factors that need to be taken into account as you repurpose an old drug for a new use. It, it may require new thinking. And you're right. You can't be too quick to say it doesn't work and you can't be too quick to say that it does work. I mean, dexamethasone is a beautiful example where if you give people dexamethasone before they're hospitalized or before they would be hospitalized with COVID, they actually have worse outcomes than if you don't give them dexamethasone. But if you give them dexamethasone after they're hospitalized and already in oxygen, which is when we believe that the immune system is in overdrive, you actually improve outcomes. And so to your point, if the first trial was done on, hey, let's give dex to people to prevent them from getting sick and hospitalized, you would have gotten a negative result, but you give them the right time, you get a positive result. So it's about timing. It's about dose. It's sometimes about the route of administration, remdesivir, is an IV infusion. Um, it turns out that um, there's a subcutaneous version that might be better than the IV. I mean, all of these things, um, to your point, they weren't optimized by the drug company for this new disease. And that's why we need people to think really critically. And again, why every cure exists to think critically about, okay, well, let's optimize it for the new disease. Well, it seems like that is certainly essential. It's also going to be time consuming. So in the midst of a crisis, I can imagine that people would get pretty frustrated with the, the need for that careful research, and yet people absolutely have to have that careful research. I, I want to point out an example we know of a drug that got repurposed. And in fact, the, uh, the drug company, the pharmaceutical firm that uh, manufactured and was promoting this drug off-label actually was slapped with a quite hefty fine, about $400 million, wow. because they were promoting it off-label, which is against the rules. So the drug, the brand name is Neurontin. The drug is mm, probably better known now by its generic name, Gabapentin. And it was initially approved uh, as a a drug to be used with other medications to treat a particular type of ep well, epilepsy. So a very narrow focus for this indication. Yes, and then later it was also approved for treating post-herpetic neuralgia, you know, that, that, that horrible pain that can last after shingles has come and gone. So now doctors prescribe it for all kinds of things, for bipolar disorder, for all kinds of neuropathies, um, for substance abuse, for insomnia, for anxiety. I mean, there are a lot of things doctors are prescribing it for. And we don't have any way of knowing, you know, A, how well does it work for some of these indications, and B, what's the best way to use it if it does work? And what are the side effects? These are all the, the right questions. And I think, again, I, I'll say this is why I think every cure is so important to be created so that we can have a group where we look across all drugs and all diseases and look for the opportunities that make the most sense to help people evaluate them, determine what are those side effects, do the clinical trials to prove out that these work. I mean, one of the biggest realizations for me early on was so surprising was in our entire healthcare system, there's no entity that is responsible for looking at all uses of all drugs and making sure that they're being used in the right way. And, and I've spoken to colleagues at the FDA and I, I serve on the board for the foundation for the FDA. And I've you know, learned that the FDA does not believe that its role is, is to regulate the practice of medicine. The FDA believes its role is to regulate commercial manufacturers of medicine to make sure that the drugs that they're putting on the market are safe and effective. Um, but they don't regulate the practice of medicine. What you described using gabapentin for off-label uses, that's the practice of medicine. That's not what the drug was approved by the FDA for. And now over 80% of our FDA approved drugs are generic, which means that over 80% of the time, no drug company cares about how it's being used or what it's being used for. And that's where someone, and in this case, every cure needed to step in and say, we're going to actually look into how these things are being used. We're going to generate evidence. And in some cases, our evidence is going to say, you should not be using gabapentin for you name it. Um, you know, maybe, uh, you know, uh, uh, pain due to injury. You know, the gabapentin is not good for pain following injuries. And 
we're going to want to tell people that you shouldn't use it for this reason because the cost benefit analysis of the of your cytopec profile is not not positive but i think it, the the point here is we need to have some entity doing that we are so excited about this possibility because there's so many drugs that we really want to see tested i mean for example viagra yeah. I mean, Viagra is now being prescribed not just for erectile dysfunction, but for pulmonary hypertension. It actually has that indication. But what about against Alzheimer's disease? There's just some new research out in the last couple of months suggesting that sildenafil, the generic form of Viagra, might be helpful there. Then there's all the new exciting research about viral theory, viral etiology, of Alzheimer's disease. And Terry, we've talked to researchers who have suggested that maybe vaccination against herpes. Or wow. valacyclovir, which is an antiviral drug yeah. and it might be useful. And just in the last month, we've seen a fascinating study suggesting that oral ketamine, a drug that my mentor, Dr. Ed Domino at the University of Michigan helped develop for anesthesia. It was known as <laughs> Ketalar. It's, it's now still used, ketamine, for anesthesia. It's great against pain, but it might work in an oral form against depression and suicide. Wow. So there's all these opportunities. We need every cure. <laughs> Tell us more about your goals for the future. Well, I, I so appreciate you saying that because I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, these drugs that are on the pharmacy shelf that could be useful for patients um, in need and there's patients suffering at the same time, it just the work has to be done. So um, first step is building out this AI platform, which we um, receive federal funding to build out. Um, we already have a beta version where we're already generating scores and we've been really pleased with the performance of those scores early on um, between our testing and our training data sets. So that's, that's step one. Step two is then to identify, rank, and prioritize the most promising opportunities. So our scores will tell us that this drug for this disease, leucovorin, looks promising for, for uh, autism spectrum disorder, for example. You know, once we get these prioritized hits, from the knowledge graph and from our AI platform, then we have a team of drug developers to say, well, what's the likely impact of this? What is the um, biological rationale? Does that look strong separate from what AI is saying? And what's the feasibility? What would a clinical trial look like to do this, to do this drug in that disease? And then from there, we then select what are the drug disease matches that we actually want to generate evidence on? Are we going to run a clinical trial? Are we going to set up a registry? Are we going to um, go through the published literature to combine all the case reports that have been written. Um, and then finally, once we generate that evidence and we feel, gosh, this drug really works for this disease, that's where we then go out and proactively reach out to doctors, to patients, to, to researchers, to payers, providers, to make sure that, that the drug is prescribed and that it's reimbursed by insurance companies. And, and since we want to focus on the 80% of drugs that are already generic, our cause will be a lot easier to advocate for than if we were advocating for expensive drugs to be used in new ways. Dr. David Wegenbaum, thank you ever so much for coming back to talk with us again on the People's Pharmacy today. Oh, thanks so much for having me. It's been so fun to chat about all this stuff. You've been listening to Dr. David Wegenbaum. He is Associate Professor of Medicine and Founding Director of the Center for Cytokine Storm Treatment and Laboratory at the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Fagenbaum is also co-founder and president of Every Cure and co-founder and president of the Castleman Disease Collaborative Network. His book is Chasing My Cure, A Doctor's Race to Turn Hope into Action. Lynn Siegel produced today's show. Al Wadarski engineered. Dave Graydon edits our interviews. B.J. Lederman composed our theme music. This show is a co-production of North Carolina Public Radio, WUNC, with The People's Pharmacy. The People's Pharmacy is made possible in part by Cocoa Via Dietary Supplements. September is Healthy Aging Month. Why not take care of your heart and brain health by adding cocoa flavanols to your daily routine for cardiovascular and cognitive support? More information at cocovia.com. 
Today's show is number 1,401. You can find it online at peoplespharmacy.com. That's where you can share your comments about today's interview. You can also reach us through email, radio at peoplespharmacy.com. Our interviews are available through your favorite podcast provider, including YouTube Music. You'll find the podcast on our website on Monday morning. At peoplespharmacy.com, you could sign up for our free online newsletter and get the latest news about important health stories. When you subscribe, you also get regular access to information about our weekly podcast. You could find out ahead of time which topics we'll be covering. In Durham, North Carolina, I'm Joe Graydon. And I'm Terry Graydon. Thanks for listening. Please join us again next week. Thank you for listening to the People's Pharmacy Podcast. It's an honor and a pleasure to bring you our award-winning program week in and week out. But producing and distributing this show as a free podcast takes time and costs money. If you like what we do and you'd like to help us continue to produce high-quality, independent healthcare journalism, please consider chipping in. All you have to do is go to peoplespharmacy.com slash donate. Whether it's just one time or a monthly donation, you can be part of the team that makes this show possible. Thank you for your continued loyalty and support. We couldn't make our show without you.